cool. that has to do with golf balls. So outstanding. I know nothing about golf. Me neither. Yes. Welcome back to the high tech act root to fruit. Uh, my name is Marcel Tassara, and uh, I'm on a quest to understand the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences and to cover my face. There's only something else to do. Cover my face with this tape here. And so, uh, so yeah, I want to I want to excavate these roots so that the fruit that we deliver is as pristine as possible. And today I am joined by Glenn Callahan. He is a professor at San Jose. State University and a uh, longtime contributor to contextual behavioral sciences. Um, you've you've been at the table for a long time. You got your PhD at in, in Reno in the late '90s. So That's right. You were there in the thick of it, and uh, yeah, maybe in many ways you were in the room where it happened. I, I think I was in some of the rooms for sure when it was going on. I was around the rooms when ACT was rising. It had shifted from comprehensive distancing into ACT by the time I got there in like 92. And then I was certainly in the room while FAP grew up. Yeah. 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 So um, we are, uh, I am thrilled, really, really thrilled that you're uh, willing to sit down and chat with me today. Thank you. Yeah. If you had, if you had some entrance music, what would it be? <laughs> um, well, I think if it was kind of uh, uh, getting up for something exciting, uh, uh -huh. it would be Parabola by Tool. Okay. Um, and then if it was mellow, um, maybe something by Tallest Man on Earth or uh, something in between is a band I really love, a singer-songwriter named Bones of J.R. Jones. Okay. So maybe right. the, the drop by him. Check him out. Yeah. I just Crazy into music. I, I, I just, uh, I think, I just opened up this can of worms. I've had a bunch of Fugazi for a while, and just today it came on my shuffle for the first time, and I thought, yeah, oh, this is, this is, this is a new something I'm going to, I'm going to dig into. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Early DIY. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, um, yeah. So, so I've been on this quest and I've had some awesome guides. Um, I left off last talking to Emily Sandoz. I don't know if you ever heard of her. <laughs> Absolutely. I've written with her. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I, I guess maybe we could just kind of jump into this whole functional assessment piece, yeah. if, if that sounds okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So where should we start with that? I, I think one of the it's a great question about where to start. You know, typically if I was thinking about if I was in a classroom where I'd start, you know, what is the definition, but maybe one quick step back from there is, is to situate the idea of functional assessment at, uh, into kind of psychotherapy, okay. clinical behavior analysis. Um, and so, so functional assessment, functional analysis, and we can do a quick kind of, uh, partition of what those terms are, basically is just a way to understand the richness of what's happening to a client, a person, me, you, anybody, as they move through the world with respect to the variables that come before and after what they do, or said differently, give rise to and maintain mm -hmm. what they do, or change what they do. What's another so way it's just, to, to say yeah. variables? Um, Contingencies, uh, you could say um, events, you know, okay. event might be useful. So you think about it, an action that occurs in a context and the context is defined minimally by parameters, by mm -hmm. these edges mm -hmm. that include um, the event that comes before or the occurrence of the situation that comes before and the event that follows that then either makes it more likely you'd see the act Thing again, the behavior again, or possibly less likely. Okay. So, yeah, the idea is it's it's just. Did you see me kind of going to sleep there? Is that is that what I, that I did a little bit? Which <laughs> I think I think uh, if we did a functional assessment on my teaching skills, we would say that Marcel went went glassy eyed, uh, 
I paused and said another way to say it, right? In an effort to uh, uh-huh. encourage an alternate response from you. But this is an important right. point, though, because yeah. this, this stuff, right. this this these this stuff. That's a really intelligent word I like to use all the time. These these yeah. topics are not the most thrilling to to read. And, no, and that's, I think yeah, it's it's. Yeah. I mean, part of has been part of the departure from the origin, right? Right. 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 So this stuff is. Um, not to disrespect engineers by using this term, this is like the engineering side of things. Mm-hmm. And so it's not the user interface that's so much more interesting, yeah. right? So if I pull up a website and it's really well built, I think this is cool. This is all I care about. And somebody spent a long time trying to build that. And the way they built it was from this particular science that understands variables, events in a particular way that as the consumer, I don't care about, but as the builder, I would. Yeah. Right. And so so you're right. So that the challenge historically the behavior analysis has had in the clinical world is it kind of the terms are dry. It kind of demystifies really cool, magical things. Right. Mm-hmm. So like like what is going on between me and a client when when somebody like uh, I think it was Irvin Yalom or probably other people said it's the relationship that heals. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think as a clinician, yeah, I think that's right. But there's nothing really to that. There's some magic happening in the room. But but as a scientist, I don't want to sell magic. Mm-hmm. As a metaphysicist, I guess I would. But <laughs> but that's not kind of my job. Mm-hmm. And so instead, I got to unpack it. And so what is the relationship in the room? It's a set of variables that are occurring, interchanged between two people or exchanged yeah. between two people that give rise to a set of behaviors that I assume are, here's more totally uninteresting language, mutually reinforcing. And we could say rewarding, but even then we start to drift away from the core, right, right of, of, of the precision of what we mean. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, how, like is that, how is that is, drifting? Go, go ahead. Yeah, you're, I think you're going to answer well, that. Well, a reward is, I think, a little bit more common vernacular than the concept or principle of reinforcement. Okay. And, and all the principle means is the thing that follows a behavior makes it more likely that that behavior will occur again, probabilistically mm-hmm. in the future. Whereas a reward, I might tell my kids, hey, you know, do you want to work for a reward? Or, or I might feel like I'm re- working for a reward at, at school or, or somewhere else. And it may or may not come. It may or may not actually function as a reward. And by function, we just mean, you know, what does it do? What did it buy you? What did it get you? That's all the function really is if that makes sense. So, yeah, so I could, yeah, yeah. I could say, Hey, uh, to my son, uh, why don't I reward you with a, a trip to, gosh, I don't know, the frozen yogurt place or something. Cause you just did so well on this. And he doesn't really want frozen yogurt. What he wants is more game time. Right. Which is cause it's crack. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's probably appropriate here, but, and so, so, <laughs> it is crack. so it I really is, I get, it is right. Especially some of these like first person games that they play anyway. So, so the function, right. The idea of, well, I take him to the yogurt place, but it doesn't really make him do that cool thing he just did. Say it was like focus studying or he actually picked up a book on his own rather than be told you got to read something. And and so he doesn't do that thing again because the reward I gave wasn't a reinforcer. Mm-hmm. The only It only functions technically as a reinforcer. The idea of all of this, I, I don't want to get too jargony too fast here, but the idea of all of this is that the functional assessment idea is bringing this incredible precision to what we're talking about in as much as we can, given the complexity of human beings, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that idea of like, isn't science fun when it's in a Petri dish yeah. because it's so it's a closed system and isn't science a disaster when we look at weather because it is the definition of an open system mm-hmm. and humans are all out there in an open system worse than weather because they're generating their own behavior right? Not, not necessarily behavior analytically, but like they're kind of spontaneously doing all these things you wouldn't predict. So they're just making a mess of science. <laughs> so we're trying to bring this behavior analysis on to understand the richness and complexity of human behavior. And so the precision is about trying to, I think, get a little bit more, um, a little bit more accurate with what we mean when we say, you know, uh, did a, a reinforcer follow? Well, it depends, you know, was, was the thing a reinforcer that followed the behavior? Well, it depends, did the behavior increase or not, mm-hmm. right? Parents who put kids in timeout, I use timeout, I put them in timeout 
and you listen to how they did it and you realize like well you, you sort of did but didn't it didn't function as time out because the kid kept doing the problem behavior right after and in part that was because you were talking to the kid the whole time going into time out through time out and the kid was just getting a lot of social connection mm -hmm. and so what you thought was this event to try to decrease behavior actually increased behavior because the kid was getting all kinds of reinforcement mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm. okay. does that sort of make sense so does, so we're using the precision a little bit but i know it is super dry mm -hmm. not seductive right you think about like you know um if I had a psychotherapy that said, what would it be like for you to sit with your thoughts as they are, not what they say they are? You're like, ooh, that sounds really cool. And then we say, well, behavior analytically, what's going on? And you say, ooh, that's super complicated, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, or in, in the research where I spent you know, most of my career is in the interpersonal arena, mm -hmm. largely publishing in, uh, around functional analytic psychotherapy. And then now moving it towards this title we're using interpersonal behavior therapy. If we say, well, like, wouldn't it be cool if you could use the relationship in the room to help clients improve? And, and, and the answer from a scientific approach that we've shown is you can, but what does that actually mean? Use the relationship. What, what, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. And so, so the idea is you bring this analysis to create specificity to a very complex human process. Yeah. Okay. And so I took you off course a little bit there. Do you remember, <laughs> do you remember where, where you were going? Mm -hmm. So I think that gives kind of a rich bucket of where functional assessment or functional analysis sits. So, so there are great definitions online mm -hmm. that some of the best definitions are actually when you go to applied behavior analysis web pages that were built for parents mm. and where the ABA, especially someone who's doing like a, a applied behavior analysis intervention, yeah. is explaining it to parents using not the language that I tried to start with. And, and what they're going to say is um, something like a functional assessment is where we try to understand the variables that come before and give rise to a behavior or occasion a behavior and the variables or things that come after the events that come after that make it more likely that behavior continues or doesn't. Mm -hmm. And and so the functional assessment is the naming of what they call the primarily four, you'll hear it as three, term contingency, which just means three variables depending on each other. That's all, all that's just a fancy way of saying there's these three variables that always sit as a unit, they all interact. The fourth term, I'll, I'll, most of us now are talking about kind of more not most, but some of us are talking about more reflexively rather than say a three term, it's a fourth, four term contingency. But those three terms are stimuli, mm -hmm. right? Here's the horrible language or the stuff that comes before. The A in behavior analysis, antecedent events. The B, the behavior is the response. So you see stimulus, response and consequences. And the consequences then are the contingencies of reinforcement, which are actually just stimuli again. Right. So you see this little S that's got an asterisk sometimes, the little mm -hmm. star sign, an R, stimulus response, and then an arrow with consequences that follow. And that'll be another S. Right. So so anyway, that's way too technical. But the idea is the three term contingency is a unit. We try to understand the behavior as always. This is the part that I would love for, for you to get, for people to get. Mm -hmm. Always depends. The behavior always depends on the context it's in what comes before and after it. Mm -hmm. that it is is arguably the only way to understand actually an act in context is by looking at the contingency analysis yeah. if i can i'll just say the fourth term and then i'll, I'll Please, try to pull yeah. back so yeah. so so we could actually have a conversation not me just like <laughs> so the 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 fourth term i think they talk like, about people like that chicken sound you make <laughs> blah, 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 blah. no the, well, no, I'm just kidding. you're blah blah you're it's, it's, it's great. It's great to listen to. <laughs> and so that, uh, well, so when I'm really going in like supervision, I'm like, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> and so, um, the fourth term mm -hmm. is kind of the cradle I think of as the cradle that holds that three term contingency, which are called establishing operations or establishing functions sometimes. And all that means is the reinforcer only works if the organism, the one doing the behaving is, is basically in a sufficient place. There's multiple uh, establishing operations, but one example is 
um, if the organism is in a state of one possibility deprivation, another would be satiation with respect mm-hmm. to the reinforcer, right? So, so the in the in the little you know think of Skinner's box, uh, the rat presses the bar for the food pellet when the rat is hungry, right? Um, a human will uh, behave towards a financial incentive when it is of sufficient value. And there's there's a few other, there's this variable called discounting, which I don't fully understand, to be honest, uh, enough to teach anyway, mm-hmm. that the organism will engage in that behavior towards a financial incentive, provided that financial incentive were sufficient and needed, right? So if you said, hey, Glenn, we can do this podcast, I'll give you five bucks. And I'd be like, <laughs> I think I'll do it for something besides five bucks. Because uh-huh. five bucks isn't, it, that's not a functional reinforcer for anything. Mm-hmm. If you said, I'll do it and I'll give you a 1957 Stratocaster that's all original, I would say, I, I would also like to do your podcast, thank you, <laughs> right? I would work like crazy for uh-huh. something like that. Uh-huh. But notice how, arbitrary the reinforcer is to the organism who's working towards it right so if i told my wife my partner jen if i said hey i'll give you this 1957 stratocaster if you go do x or y she'd be like don't want it don't need it not sure why you'd offer that Mm -hmm. i'm like oh it's worth twenty thousand dollars she's like just give me the 20 you know um the reinforcer works if it functions for that person to you know initiate, sustain, maintain the behavior. It's all dependent on the individual and and their history with that reinforcement, which, yeah, I should stop there. Okay. So, and, and, um, this fourth contingency, could you say more about the importance of that for clinicians? Mm -hmm. I think so. So if we said, if we said it at a basic human level, we said, well, I'm, I'm going to praise this individual for doing something really useful well they they would work for praise like a lot of humans will work for social social contingencies Mm -hmm. provided they're not satiated in praise if if we were doing something in therapy and a client were really struggling and i'm trying to think of of how the the establishing operation would matter here let's say that that I knew a client was was pretty disconnected, was pretty isolated. And so what I, I decided was to try to increase the behavior of social communication, mm-hmm. um, may, maybe in a, in a pretty basic way, maybe even asking for a need met or a disclosure, something like that, right? And this is a person who's pretty isolated. What I'd want to do is if I'm going to use something like the nonverbals of, oh, that's really, you know, well, if I said, oh, that's really interesting, it's verbal, but the nonverbals of leaning in a- as we might do mm-hmm. um, or other things we do to show interest. Is, is that kind of making sense? Mm-hmm. Subtle things with the face. Yeah. That, that I would do these um, with the assumption and in a behavior analysis that the person was sufficiently in a state of deprivation that they would work towards that kind of attention from me. If we took a client who's really connected up, may have some social things to work on, but doesn't need a lot of attention from me or connection from me, all of my even enthusiastic, like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting, or tell me more about this, or I, you know, I feel like I'm really getting what you're saying, they'd be like, don't matter. Yeah. Or it doesn't matter from me because of who this is, mm-hmm. the stimulus properties that I bring, right? The mm-hmm. physical characteristics could be culture, could be race, could be gender, could be um, style, right? I've said all kinds of things in sessions where I think they're going to be reinforcers. They fall flat sometimes because maybe there's this establishing operation where the person doesn't really need the thing I'm offering, like a lot of praise or a lot of attention. Or it could be because the, the style in which I'm delivering it doesn't function as a reinforcer. If I say, like you say something that's really interesting, I say, oh, totally, that's right on. And you're like, what? You're like, oh my gosh, are we in the 90s in Southern California? And the answer is, tragically, yes, in my head, we still are. Um, And so we're looking at multiple kind of contingencies or variables Mm -hmm. there, right? In that functional assessment, we're saying, you know, does the person even need this? Are they looking for this? But also, is it functioning that way when I deliver Mm -hmm. this kind of reinforcement? Okay. 
Yeah, and we're going to get more into the interpersonal work dimensions. I think that what, before you mentioned that interpersonal dynamic to, to the work with a client, where my, my, my mind was going was in terms of kind of reinforcing behaviors outside of the, uh, the, the, the office. Right, right. And so those, um, so, so those work the same way. Yeah. Sorry. Um, they, uh, the idea though, then is for me then to focus less, like you had mentioned, that was a very interpersonal kind of in session mm -hmm. response that I was focused on. Um, what I would be doing is talking with the client about, okay, so, so what is a behavior problematic, excuse me, behavior of interest, um, that they came to see me for maybe again, if we said something like social disconnection or isolation withdrawal, mm -hmm. they're hiding under the covers, um, cause it's too hard to be in the world. And we said, okay, well, when you, you know, and, and we're both in agreement for this person that that would be more useful, right? There's a whole literature that says getting engaged is more useful. Um, opportunities to increase social reinforcement, a la Lewinson from, you know, like the sixties and seventies. And we said, um, what is it that's, well, what we'd want to do functional with a functional assessment is, you know, what is going on when you stay inside and don't connect, or you have the thought that I want to connect and the person says, well, I, I get really anxious. Okay. And then what do you do? Then I hide more. I withdraw more. And we say, okay. So, so the, the thought of, I want to go do this is is among probably other kinds of things there's there's feelings that come up with that some anxiety and then you respond to that by withdrawing okay and this is all outside the room right, right. this is mm -hmm. when they're out in their life you say well okay what what could you do differently when you have that anxiety and we would try to then figure out if there was something that we could put into place that they could either go in the world. Sometimes you create a rule that they that just, you know, uh, have a history of reinforcement for rule following. So we might say like, well, I want, I want you to, to tell yourself you can do it anyway, right? You could do a cognitive intervention, which isn't inherently problematic behavior analytically. It's just the analysis is incomplete because it's just thoughts cause behavior rather than thoughts may give rise to other behavior that then are followed by consequences. Mm -hmm. So we're missing a, a contingency term. Mm -hmm. We're missing a, a a variable. So we say, okay, go try that. They go out in the world. Is there a chance they'll come back and they'll be like, well, I did the thing. Well, how did it do? It felt good that I did the thing I said I would do, right? So there's this history of reinforcement. Maybe they'll do it again. But more likely what we want is to identify that there were contingencies out there operating in the world. They're contacting possibly nature, fresh air. They pass someone who just gives them one of those nice, non-committal, friendly smiles as you pass people. Even with social distancing through a mask, mm -hmm. there you can sometimes see eyes smile. And maybe that's enough of a variable then that serves to, in small incremental steps, this successive approximations, get us towards more getting out there in the world. Is this kind of making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the analysis then is, is about things going on outside, and, and those matter massively and I would argue are probably half of what goes on in really good in session therapy. You're still talking about what goes on outside. The problem is that it's all outside. Yeah. And now as a behavior analyst, all I have access to is the story they're telling me about what goes on outside, which, you know, we suck as reporters. Mm -hmm. And so here's this verbal behavior going on for me in the room that's about things going on outside that may or may not be accurate, that I'm then going to give more verbal behavior to, to try to prompt when they're out there in the world to do the thing that's going to be much harder to do because the contingencies there yeah. are much stronger than they are with me in the room mm -hmm. because they're no longer as present. Right. So that sort of keeps swooping back. It's all about in session work, which yeah, isn't necessarily them a really all. brightly colored worksheet to carry around with them. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I do think with technology, there may be stimuli that can prompt behavior much more effectively, like mm -hmm. things on a smartphone or a, a device, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, go out in the world, notice this or something. But I do think it's still, um, that's still in its infancy and, and mm -hmm. trying to, to, to grow up. Yeah. Well, so I wonder if we could we could um, color in some of this words by a little bit of an yeah. example with um, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of a functional assessment. And the thing that came to mind for me was um, I'm going to describe some some behavior of mine 
and you can ask yeah. questions uh, if you need to, and and maybe we can we can just um, tr- understand it from a, 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 a behavioral perspective. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and if it's okay, before you jump in, so yeah. so the idea is would do exactly what you just said, which is a functional assessment. Yeah. The tiny end cap to the long, long conversation or monologue, uh, there was a functional well, analysis. <laughs> and so the, 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 the functional analysis is really the functional assessment that's been demonstrated empirically, right? And so, so if we did that with the person outside and we said, under these conditions, they do this behavior, it's followed by this, they're more likely to increase it. We've shown that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the true functional analysis, okay. right? It could be inside, but the idea is you've demonstrated it. Um, empirically, not meaning with, you know, 500 participants, but more like single case, you've yeah. shown it uh, several times. Here's how we're moving the behavior. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. So I go out every morning and I go to the woods to run and, yeah. and I, and I have to cross a golf course to get there. <clears throat> and it's, you know, it's about three, three minutes from my house to get on the trails. And at the end of the run, I, I oftentimes will slowly cross the golf course, assuming that no one is glaring at me right. for, is no one's there because there's a nice, there's a nice lagoon with some, some ducks and frogs. And, and I just kind of, I just am reflecting on, on my, uh, my, my run or whatever it's going on. And it's just a nice peaceful stretch. And so, uh, recently I've started to pick up golf balls as I, as I go for my brother, I don't play golf, but he plays golf. And I thought, oh, how, how cool would that be? In like, you know, a couple of weeks, I give him like a big bag of golf balls, you know, probably all in good condition. <laughs> and so, but what I've noticed is, is that now when I, when I cross the golf course going in and coming out, I'm just looking for golf balls. Okay. I'm not like paying attention to this, right. like what I, what I had this kind of nice reflection time and nature and what's happening. Right. I'm just like, how do I get something to, to, in my mind, how I interpret yeah. it's like, how do I get something so that he's happy with me or he, you know, he likes me and I please right. him, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I don't know what else, well, that's, that's, that's my story. And so, so part of what you're interested in there is noticing this shift from a pretty thoughtful, reflective time post run. So your body's in a particular state, maybe you've relaxation maybe you got a little bit of endorphins or something mm-hmm. from the run mm-hmm. and and but also that you enjoy this sort of free space in, in you know uh, um, I think there's a vipassana buddhism term uh, uh, equanimous or equanimity this kind of just balance this peace yeah and that that was quite it sounds like lovely mm-hmm. and then and then you shifted tasks to one also quite honestly lovely yeah. But serving a different goal, right? Where you're going to do something kind, uh, you said, for your brother. And which is like, anybody saying that, would be like, that's so cool. How kind, yeah. you know? Yeah. And and these are lost balls. It's, I mean, I think if you took one when a guy had just hit it, it would be funnier. <laughs> um, but your behavior would be under very different control at that uh-huh. point. You'd be uh-huh. like, this is me being uh, a giant pain in the butt. Um, and so, so these, you know, these are found and you're going to gift them to someone you care about. And so what I would say is if you're noticing that you're sort of missing that other part a little bit mm-hmm. and wondering how did this happen, you, 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 I, I think it's an awesome example. It would probably require m- more than what I'm about to say, but kind of a down, down and dirty, okay. right, is your behavior shifted under a different set of both antecedent and consequential events that are quite powerful. Okay. When you're coming off the course and you're probably noticing green field, open space, you might even have the thought, I just finished a run. Your body is telling you, I just finished a run. Mm -hmm. And you drift into this kind of reflective bit of peace. The variables that maintain that are probably fairly subtle and, and fairly possibly competing and and meaning like they might be quite reinforcing naturally uh, in a positive reinforcement way and by that i mean something is being added that's pleasant that's uh they don't have to be pleasant to be positive reinforcing but basically the term they use is appetitive just meaning like you'd work for it yeah you know i always think of of a buffet when when i hear that word 
Right. Well, right. And so I wouldn't work for access to a buffet because they freak me out a little bit. It's just a lot of touching. Yeah. Um, not completely, but like I'd rather we'll do just a functional assessment of that later. Oh, my God. Right. We should. No, you don't even want to go down that. Um, but but notice that that's for you, that would be quite peaceful. And I would actually share that. I think walking into a field, I'd be like, hey, get present. And notice this. You're not on a field mm-hmm. very much. You're about to go back in your house, mm-hmm. you know, like especially with what's going on in our current context. Mm-hmm something positive reinforcing that's appetitive, fairly subtle, right? Because it's not a strict rule that you're following. Like I did a good job running. I'm going to go check off my runner's log list. I'm going to tell people that I ran, I'm a runner, right? Post it on my whatever media. And then, and then there might be something slightly, slightly negatively reinforcing, meaning removing something aversive that will work for, but it's very subtle. And mm-hmm. so your like mind is drifted into kind of contemplative peace rather than I got to go do these 30 things or I've mm-hmm. got issues with the house or the kids or whatever it is. But they're fairly subtly operating. And we shift that to collecting golf balls, which is really delightfully explicit. It's quite physical mm-hmm. with a known product. Right. Mm. So if, if you go out there and you're like, I'm looking for golf balls, I find one, I pick it up, I put it, there is still something about this is in the service of my brother and a connected no. relationship, no. but it's also literally immediately reinforcing. Mm. You know, it's almost just, like if, wait, real quick, yeah. though, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to finish that thought, though? It's almost like no, what? No, 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 okay. no. Well, I was going to say, like, if we could give a client a golf ball for doing the right thing, like, hey, good job now <laughs> self-injuring. Here's the golf ball. And they're like, Shh, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I totally wanted a golf ball. Right. Which we're laughing because that's insane. So I, I did find a hot pink one today. I don't know that that might work. But how fun, right? Yeah. And you're probably like, cool, I don't know if he has a hot, but maybe he'll think it's funny or he'll think yeah. like, why did you give me a hot pink golf ball, right? Uh, okay, so when you talked about the subtlety of the, the first yeah. behavior, yeah. what I thought about in terms of we're stay on this food, uh, you know, buffet mm-hmm. train, right. is I'm thinking of like <laughs> eating eating kale versus eating Doritos. Or like, anything than kale, right? Yeah, really, <laughs> a dirt or bark, right? They make kale chips and you think, what? Why would you do that? That's they're just actually, mean. They're actually pretty good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just sassing kale. I sorry. Know, I know. You are on the, yeah, so, You're on the left coast, so you got to do that. Well, because it's just, it's omnipresent, right? Yeah, you can't yeah. get it, not kale salad. Anyway, so you were saying. So I'm just saying in terms of the, yeah. the subtleness of the reinforcer. Yeah. Um, can we, can, is there any parallels there between f- f- like, you know, strong tasting food and kind of not so strong tasting food is that well, well i think there there must be right and what what i again I, I don't mean to be like like only banging on one or two drums here but that's kind of my thing mm-hmm. and and what i love about that question is you know what foods might be more reinforcing um you know as, as a re- function as a reinforcer mm-hmm. and all of that depends on the individual yeah and what right? i'm trying so, to reinforce right yeah, well, I think so, for sure. Like, could, could you use food to reinforce? We had mentioned the idea of like a, 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 an effective social skill or something. And I yeah. think like may, maybe. Well, but I'm not, and I don't mean literally. Yeah. I just mean in terms yeah. of conceptually kind of understanding this reinforcer that you talked right. about as far as being a, a quietness and a subtle, you know. Right. Not, and it's not the strength. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to finish that question, but I think you're hearing what I'm asking. Yeah. Hopefully. And it, 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 so, so, yeah, and we can circle back around to that. But the idea of food and its individual functions for mm-hmm. a particular person, given their history, like, like, would, would I work, you know, or, or even just ask for certain foods, uh, because they taste good, or they have stronger taste or something like that, or the texture, whatever it is. And I think, I think it depends on my history with that food, my actual, the funk that, and, and by this, I mean like the literal working of my tongue, whether it works very well. Um, I don't have a sense of smell. And so I'm going to lose a lot of things on the way in, mm. but certain things I absolutely would go to a restaurant and request where other people would be like, Oh, that's way too spicy or that's soup. What a weird choice for you or something like that. Mm-hmm. Because I think again, when we talk about how the reinforcer is functioning, it's operating in multiple ways. There might be a, a taste that's quite pleasant. Mm-hmm. There is, there's a theory, and I don't know what, you know, there might be data for this, that like spicy foods in particular, we kind of want more of them. They're sort of stimulating something right. at kind of, yeah, at a, I think at a neurotransmitter level, they talk about this, oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, they also stimulate thirst. And so for me, that's mm -hmm. also something, you know, like drink more water and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so, so the subtleties of the contingencies that are operating there, I think are important to notice. The pragmatic step back is, well, is the behavior going or not, right? Like, so is the behavior continuing? Is the behavior of interest decreasing, mm -hmm. increasing, mm -hmm. maintaining? And what I love about your example is, well, one of those behaviors really rose up and it looks like that particular skill set, the physical retrieval of the golf ball, maybe other things of like, because you could even say like, I got to, I got to be honest, it hurts my back to pick them up. Um, I don't know where to put these things, mm -hmm. but I, I have love to touch my... them. Like speaking of right. icky buffet line. Right. right. Well, and that <laughs> makes sense. My too. shirt and like leaves to pick them up. <laughs> right. <laughs> but if that, if that whole thing followed with, but I love my brother mm -hmm. and I'd be like, that's the thing that's the contingency that's probably dominant there. Mm -hmm. If, if there were other aversives, part of yeah. that, like back pain, or you're yeah. saying like handling, you know, something that feels repugnant. And, and then we would say, well, it sounds like what's really kind of driving that potentially is something about the connection with your brother doing something kind. And maybe you have a history, right? So what, what, what is that? Well, there's a history of possibly exchange of really positive. That is something that's being added. That's appetitive, really kind of maintaining that. Yeah. Or you could say, and I don't mean this is like choose your own adventure where now we're like 40 pages off the, 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 the plot, but you could also say, because you know, Glenn, it's just, we've been at odds most of our life mm -hmm. and I don't know him, but I know he golfs and maybe he would like this. And there's something then that, well, I think you're, you're and, and then you say, you know, because I'm just afraid of losing him. And so I think, okay. What a cool gesture. And also this behavior is in part under the contingencies of negative reinforcement. You're trying to escape out. I don't want to lose him. I have to make this move. That's not bad. But there may be other ways then to say, hey, you know, wh what if what if we worked with your brother, uh, you know, on, on what you're trying to do with your brother that was going to accomplish some of the goals, for sure do the golf balls, but also that let you maybe say some of the things that you want actual answers to rather mm -hmm. than, does this make sense? So yeah. depending on what's really driving that behavior, mm -hmm. the moving from quiet, reflective thought to now I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm scanning, I'm, I'm on the green. That's all I'm thinking about. I'm picking up golf balls that the contingency shifted because there's something quite powerful about golf ball picking, mm -hmm. which may be just the aesthetics of collecting like for little collector animals. Mm -hmm. um, it could also be negative reinforcement around relationships. It could be something quite positive reinforcement of, hey, we like, we just do cool things for each other. And that's, that's, there's a lot of laughs and there's a lot, you know, he's going to love the, who, who it's a pink golf ball, whatever it is. Uh -huh. Right. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I, I always, I really always uh, like hearing functional contextualists say, that's not bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It makes me, yeah, feel, it well, loosens me up a little bit to be able to kind of, you know, just talk. <laughs> well, I think, I think what's so cool about that comment is, and it sounds like, like really, my guess is your journey in the podcast with mm -hmm. people will be to help them understand, like from a clinical behavioral perspective, there is no good or bad. There is just, there is what continues the behavior and there is what decreases the behavior. We add a conceptual kind of morality to it, which I'm not opposed to. Right. I, I, I don't think it's all good. Right. That, that, oh, well, that's isn't that interesting that his behavior is maintained by shooting people like, no, that's super not OK. <laughs> we could do an analysis of mm -hmm. why it's reinforcing to do that. That's yeah. like messed up, you know, mm -hmm. like that. Is it escape behavior? Is it like you feel, oh, God, I don't even know if I want to do the analysis. But I think that we, we can say this behavior is is deeply problematic or what we can consider immoral yeah. but the behavior just is right and so like you know let's say you said so so i've collected like 400 of them and they're filling up a room or something like that of these golf mm -hmm. balls mm -hmm. and 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 that's that's a concern and i'm a little worried that this this filling up the room is now becoming kind of an obsession um, then we could say, well, that's not necessarily bad, but 
if it's in the service of something that's about you escaping out of anxiety and feels out of control, why don't we address that? So, so to finish this idea that there is no good or bad, I think what, what we're trying to say, again, not that we can't bring a morality and agree like harming people, taking away people's choices, um, that some of us may agree that's, that's bad, but it's also problematic. Right. And so in this idea of like hoarding golf balls, let's say that you were doing that, you think I got a room full of like 40,000 golf balls or something like, whoa, um, that's not bad. Mm -hmm. Self-injury isn't bad. It's really problematic. It's dangerous uh, infection bleeding out, things like that. And so what we want to say is, okay, what is this more problematic behavior that's probably not allowing a person to work towards their goals, their values, their own personally defined reinforcers to speak Mm -hmm. technically. And what could we notice about, you know, maybe that golf ball collecting is under the control of negative reinforcement. I feel really anxious. I got to go gather up, you know, 12 balls and I count them four times and I put them in and I feel better briefly. Then I got to go back and do it again. And you say, okay, well, it sounds what people would call obsessive, but in particular, the target behavior is this golf ball collecting that serves to decrease anxiety temporarily. Hey, what if we found another thing to help decrease anxiety that wasn't golf ball hoarding, right? And we we put a different behavior mm-hmm. in place. I'm having the thought of something and say, well, what if you tried this instead and it actually did alleviate some of the anxiety? Maybe that's more effective, right? Yeah. So we talk less about good and bad and more about what is effective, less effective, what I might say sometimes is what is problematic, what is more useful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, for a lot of our clients, helping them to see that as not helpful in their lives is, is, it's really challenging. That's the, that's really where the rubber meets the road. Because it does work. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the, such the interesting thing about function is the reality is if you were a golf ball hoarder, which I don't want to, or some pretend like people are going to walk by, I did not know he hoarded golf balls, right? Suddenly you're eating golf balls in the mail in some super creepy way. And so, so if we had a client who was the golf ball hoarder, it works to go gather the golf balls, right? It, it works if I've had a bad day to drink two beers, Mm -hmm. it decreases anxiety. So it functions. Negative reinforcement is very powerful. It functions to increase the likelihood of that behavior because we've taken away this aversive state, Mm -hmm. right? That's the negative reinforcement. But in the long run, it doesn't work. It's not as effective. And you're right with clients, that's hard. It's both hard to have them see the long term for all of us, but also it's hard to orient you away from the short term, right? You know, it's like, it's, it's, well, I should, you know, we're talking about like, let's consume less. It's kind of fun to look on Amazon sometimes, right? And see like, <laughs> I did not know that was such a good deal. And I, you know, suddenly you're spending this time shopping for crap yeah. you don't need. Yeah. Because it's, it's reinforcing. Is it taking me away from something I don't want to do? Probably. Yeah. Is it also kind of fun and pleasant? Yeah. Cause they have shiny things. <laughs> And so how do you orient that really powerful set of contingencies to something like, hey, let's consume it. Why don't you go take a walk? Like, can I bring my phone to look at Amazon? Like, like so, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's hard to get us to orient to those longer term. By, by the way, um, I was looking at your books on Amazon. And when I put your name in this, the first book that comes up is the Di- Diabetes Lifestyle book. You know what the second <laughs> That's book Jen, that comes Jen's up book. is? Yeah. Well, you're on, no. you're an author on there. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. Yeah. An, a, a book called Secret Men's Business. No, that's surprising that I wrote that. <laughs> Sometimes I've taken big psychedelic trips. I'll write whole books. I'm just kidding. Oh, well, I'm wondering maybe we could jump into a role play around this scenario, yeah, yeah. and you could you could demonstrate what what it would look like for you to work with someone who's who's bringing this to you. Yeah. The reason the. I think that one of the things I've I've seen about myself is sometimes uh, I kind of orient towards like accommodating others rather than mm-hmm. you know. Um, and that that in in this situation, it's it's can be a little bit problematic. In tr- I see it as problematic because I'm. I found that that stretch that walk to be a really peaceful, nice time for me, and right. um, and now I'm I'm like looking for someone else, and it's taking me away from that. And and I just and I can see how it's like I'm like kind of tunnel vision on on this instead of you yeah. know the the grander scenery around me. Yeah. So so when you say that 
in your history, you've worked to, I think you would put it, accommodate others. Mm -hmm. Did I hear that right? And then you said, rather than, and there were the dot, 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 when you said that, uh, Mm -hmm. can you tell me rather than what? I guess rather than really be in tuned with what I'm interested in and Mm -hmm. uh, what Mm -hmm. excites me and and rather than excites me in relationship to, you know, uh, winning someone over or gaining approval or... Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's super useful to notice about yourself. I I imagine there's a journey that had to occur to get to that place, Mm -hmm. to have that kind of self-awareness. So awesome. Yeah. And I think, and it's super helpful for me actually to hear that about you. And I don't mean that in a a sort of contrived way, except that there's a a, a greater depth actually to understanding the the golf ball Mm. kind of collecting. Um, And so you're wondering, you know, is it, is there a question there of like, can I get back to this? Or are you worried that that's a problem? Are you worried what my thoughts are? Kind of tell me, Mm. tell me some of your, your thoughts. Well, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, mm, I'm not opposed to collecting golf balls. I just don't want that to be the only thing I do. Right. This is the way to put it. And, uh, and I think there's also some kind of, you know, how can I do it all rule yeah. it's not, or, you know, um, guiding principle of, you know, needing to maximize everything all the time. Right. And in that maximizing, you really enjoy that reflective time, but also you want to be able to accommodate or please people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I think the where I'd want to start with this is to notice that's, that's all good. Yeah. It's all fine. And I want to use good in quotes in the sense of like, um, you're not struggling with how do I not harm somebody? And so to kind of take a breath and notice like, cool, like you got some different things. And at the same time, just working to accommodate or please may not be exactly what you, want all the time in your life like Mm -hmm. of course we have to do that sometimes right Mm -hmm. and we got we gotta be a good tribe member right i think so that's a great way to put it Mm -hmm. and there's a chance that the golf ball collecting which we can agree is kind to do for your brother Mm -hmm. is is actually maybe pulling you from something if it becomes more a little bit more golf ball much less kind of personal reflective time which mm-hmm. is hard to come by sometimes in our lives right mm-hmm. and, and it sounds like was really valuable to yeah you. yeah and, and the, the, the oh go ahead go ahead oh I was just gonna say and so so that feels out of balance and we don't need to say well just stop ever collecting golf balls I don't think it's that simple because the collecting now it sounds like is is being pulled by a couple of things one is it's probably uh, quite uh, delightful to hunt and find mm-hmm. right I like, I like free shit right well free shit is perfect and scavenger hunts are actually fun when they're done well right and so you're on a little mini scavenger hunt and doing something kind for a family member also good uh-huh. and at the same time it isn't just that driving the golf ball collection that there's something larger for you interpersonally that you've noticed mm-hmm. that this may also be about people pleasing uh-huh. and while i want to do this for my brother and that that is kind, I actually want to be able to focus a little bit of that time on me, mm-hmm. right? And so so when we feel that go out of balance like that, I wonder if it's because these um, consequences, these things happening, right, are... <laughs> Do you want to keep going with that? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. So, so these consequences, <laughs> sorry, these consequences are quite powerful. And in yeah. fact, a little bit, a, a little, not, it's not too powerful, but powerful enough to pull me off of what matters to me also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, I think what's worth exploring, um, can I just tell you that I barely noticed that that was related to a time limit? How tragic is that for me? Right? Like, oh, your phone went off. That's weird. So the idea is, 
that if it's pulling you away from, if it if it's if it's pulling you away from what matters, then we may want to look at the people pleasing as being less effective sometimes. Does does that make sense? That yeah. what's what's more what's equally important is not just that sometimes we have to pe- please people. Sometimes it's fun to get free stuff. Sometimes it's fun to find things to do things for our family. But also that there's a larger struggle that might show up of am I worth that time also? Mm-hmm. Does that sort of make sense? That, yeah. that it's not at all like, you know, screw the golf balls, let's just focus on you time. Like, no, relationships matter fundamentally and you yeah. matter fundamentally. So I I would wonder then in, in the kind of analysis, in, in the looking at the system, is to talk about what comes up when when you have the thought like, I'm actually worth this time and space right now or whatever it is that doesn't feel hokey, but is enough to be like, I don't know if that's true all the time, you know, like that that's really evocative. And then, and then what tools could we bring? Do you see? So we're making a target there. This is stepping out of the role play and now mm-hmm. talking about theory. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, functional assessment is about creating targets and then understanding that, you know, behavioral targets, behavioral events that we want to focus on for change and talking about what comes before and after that maintain those. And so we might say, hey, you, like me, like so many people, um, I wonder if something to work on there is being being open to, willing to focus on your own needs, right? So the, it's the curse of the therapist, right? So we're giving, 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 and we're mm-hmm. like, what do you need? Like, I'm fine. You're like, you're missing a leg. <laughs> it's totally fine. They needed the leg. They needed the leg. I have another. I've always liked limping, you know, and you're like, holy mm-hmm. crap. And so, and we're not trying to make the, you know, the me time for three minutes on a, on a golf course, yeah. you know, bigger than it is, but to figure out like, what are the contingencies that give rise to that? What are the variables that make it so I'm more likely to refocus this attention on this task? Like, Hey, I want my focus time, but, but my brother, or what if he doesn't like me or wait, but, but very subtle, right? Cause I don't know that we have verbal access to all of the subtleties. Like, you know, if I'm doing something that, you know, it's going to, my mom lives in the area and I might do something that upsets her. You know, I don't, I'm not able to like not picking up golf balls for her. Right. Or take her to a doctor appointment or something Uh like that. One of those two things. And I would choose (laughs) the golf balls. Um, If I'm about to say yes, okay, I'll do it. Like, okay. But what is that under the control of? Is it just escape behavior? Is it also like, it's good to do things for family, but noticing that, I actually need to protect some of my own space as well. And am I worth that? Is that okay to do? Does this kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So Mm -hmm. then we bring these tools on, like Axe got some great strategy for noticing thoughts, as does different, different, uh, there are different versions of uh, mindfulness meditation. MBCT could do this as well. Um, On the interpersonal side, we would say like, okay, well, you know, if we were exploring this broadly in therapy, like, okay, when you do something for your brother, what follows it? You know, like we might ask, how does he react to that? How does he respond to that? Oh, it's great. We laugh and, um, and it eases tension or whatever. And I might say like, I wonder if there's other things you could do that might be harder. They might feel riskier. Mm-hmm. And, and some of it depends like how you're gendered. Right. So like, what if you told your brother that he mattered? Like, dude, I would never do that. Right. I've told guys like you matter to me in, in like just hanging out and I get a variety of, but it's like a really connected moment. Right. And you're laughing because it goes exactly like how you would think, which is <laughs> like, I'm having this strong feeling of someone I deeply care about. Yeah. With the exception of one, they mostly are like, dude. Mm-hmm. And one is like, you matter too. And because he's just, he's just yeah, slightly yeah. gendered just a little bit differently, I not remember. as a not man, but not as the, I'm sorry, I have to kick your ass now or whatever it is. Right. One <laughs> of my saw, friends, uh, I, yeah, go, go, ahead, ahead. go ahead. I was just saying one of my friends, I said that too. And I watched him. He has deep, profound struggle in life. Mm-hmm. Amazing human being, deep amount, uh, amount of struggle. And I said, it just, you matter so much. I don't want anything to happen to you. And he said, and I watched it go across his face and he mm-hmm. smiled and he looked up and he's a very funny guy too. And he said, you want to make out? <laughs> and he did that to uh-huh. ease the vulnerability yeah, yeah, yeah. of the moment. On that moment. note, though, I got I got to insert. So I saw Robert Kelly. He's a stand-up comedian. Yeah. And I'm going to change the language a little bit. Um, but yeah. what he said was, he was he was talking about how we're gendered and, and cultured as, as men. Yeah. He said, you know, 
I don't want to have sex with a man. I just want to hug a little bit longer. <laughs> right? So how do we get intimacy, yeah. right, where, where we've been gendered, at least maybe in a generation you might share with me, like we've been gendered into like anything that looks like connected, profound, close intimacy equals you've also had sex, right? Yeah, like how yeah. tragic is that? Right. Yeah. So, but, but that is also the reality. So we think like, what would be a reinforcer? And you're like, mm -hmm. you know, you have a guy say like, I'm not going to say that to my brother. You matter to me. Like what's wrong with you? Yeah. Right. Because they actually can predict their environment much better than I could. So, so I'm like, I'm well, gonna, it's awesome, soft and gentle or something. I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to translate what I'm hearing and to yeah. see if, if this is accurate. Uh, just by locking in on having to do one behavior to satisfy this need can be problematic. It, when yeah. I'm, I'm kind of I'm tunnel vision on that, and so yeah. so in therapy in the interpersonal realm, and you know ACT, FAP, other yeah. IBT therapies are uh, looking at helping us helping clients to kind of see other ways that these this, right. this we can communicate this, and and also. Because of the subtleness, you said we don't have this verbal access to, to, yeah. to these these forces that 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 push us. Adding context to the um, well, adding context so that when it happens, people can detect it more clearly. Yeah, and so you're teaching the client to kind of notice the way we're trained to notice behavior analytically. Uh, in the clinical realm, like we're trained to notice these things, what's operating, what might be moving, knowing that we might not get it all, right? Mm -hmm. Think about like if uh, I was I was in a meeting a while back and, and I opened a Pepsi can and a friend of mine who I've gone out drinking beers with, you know, another faculty member. I didn't know that they sold Pepsi in California. Right, no, Diet Pepsi at least. <laughs> and so uh, and so I opened it and he looked over and smiled and he, and he said, sorry, it's a reflexive response. You know, because it sounds like a beauty opening. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think about the subtleties of that, mm -hmm. of like what we're conditioned to and the individual variable history, uh, variant histories. Like each mm -hmm. of us, is, if I open one near you, you'd be like, sounds like you're opening something, you know, where he was like, here, you know. And, and so what you're saying is dead on, which is we're understanding this behavior in a context with lots of things operating that can you know, occasion a behavior that then it accomplishes some some outcome, a reinforcer that we want comes, uh, the behavior is reinforced by taking away something we don't want, so individual, mm -hmm. each person's history is slightly different. And what you're saying is, could we then offer a different way to do the thing that is accomplishing this goal to get the goal, mm -hmm. but would be maybe less potentially problematic wouldn't have to compete with also having me time would would if if it was obsessive right would be able to like ease that tension that the mind creates because we're built i think i think we're built we're certainly built to have a, a fear response because we're an animal mm -hmm. but i think this brain grew up with the big old frontal lobe to just it, what it built in was fear mm -hmm. and, and anxiety rather right and so we're built to like what is it what is it and so could we give something to ease that, right? So ACT is great for that. I think, mm -hmm. again, MBCT for some, MBSR. Um, so super not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but does, I love that as an example, right? Because it absolutely accomplishes the consequence by creating more problems, mm -hmm. right? Relieve anxiety by then giving no skills. And if we were talking long-term use, right? Mm -hmm. I think one-off use, whatever, yeah. people do what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but creates no skills and instead then creates a context of the only way I can cope is with this pill, mm -hmm. a pill that we know has tolerance and dependence profiles yeah. where the yeah. person needs more and more and can't stop. It's one of the hardest drugs to stop. Yeah. And then you die. You can die. It's one of the few drugs you can actually die from the withdrawal. From withdrawal, right? Like yeah. it and alcohol. No one should bad mouth alcohol. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those are the two, right? The others are pretty, you know, stay hydrated. You can say, you just kind of yeah. get through okay. withdrawal. Yeah. And so... I feel like we've covered good ground here today. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Just kidding. We got to drugs. Sorry. Um, I, I have a question around this, and and I'm I'm uh, Emily uh, mentioned this, and and I wanna I wanna hear you talk some more about what it means to add context to 
in in the therapy in the therapy yeah. realm like if 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 we're talking about maybe this behavior that i talked about like yeah. you, you know um, so so to try to situate it in a context maybe that's some language that you'll hear how is that okay. behavior situated in a context how does it sit in a field right if well it's well I, what i'm kind of getting at though is is like you know we might what what i heard is is this my experience of the thought of um got to got to get this for somebody mm -hmm. whatever the thought is is yeah. is is just that is is my, the one one way i experience it there's also all these other right. things that are happening within me and around me right. and so is is adding context paying attention to the visceral processes the emotional processes and helping people do that i think it can be right okay. and it, and and what sort of drives for many of us anyway a clinical functional analysis is this kind of rule of pragmatism of is it useful? Did it buy us something to even do this? Like we do a functional assessment of our functional assessment. Like, mm -hmm. is this helpful? Did it did it identify a target that we can track over time? Did it um, did it suggest variables that we could try to move around? Right. So if if we said, and I think it would be worthwhile in that in that example of you know, uh, I have the thought of I, I I need to do this to you know make sure my brother's happy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I, if I said, you know, what else is kind of going on there for you in the moment? And you say, you're like, I don't know, which, which would be the right answer, quite honestly. Uh -huh. and I say, well, let's, you know, maybe next time we'll, we'll have you keep track of your body or we could even do an eyes closed. You know, imagination is good at evoking all kinds of things, right? So uh -huh. now you're on the field. I say, well, I feel really tense. Uh, God, I got to tell you, just a tiny bit, not huge, but my heart rate's a little up. And and so you realize that all of these cues are coming together. And there's this verbal thing that we, because we're languaging beings, right, that are, we're going to grab that quickly. We might make it causal, either as a therapist or a client, say, well, I have to do something because of this thought. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's worth noticing the thought because we're good rule followers. So we have the rule, I should please my brother. So you do the thing because you're got a huge reinforcement history for rule following but there might be a whole bunch of other things going on that you don't want to have happening right mm -hmm. like you're anxious you're tense in your shoulders your um heart rate is up you you feel just weird you feel some form of discomfort right and and so what may as those behaviors are happening and this thought is occasioned among probably a ton of other thoughts, quite honestly, mm -hmm. that you're not attending to as they fly by, that you then engage in a behavior that helps ease all of this tension. And then you're more likely to do the behavior again. Like that might be one example of looking at what other somatic processes are going on. Okay. Um, there, there might be, you know, uh, better contextual variables that I'm not thinking of. And, and certainly for a different... Um, target behavior, there might be other things to, to look at. But I do think going beyond the mind, the head, the thought is super duper valuable, not only in terms of what, what happened when you had that thought, what did you do and what followed that, mm -hmm. right? Sorry, that was one part of it. The rest of the thought just fell apart. Um, so, oh, well, anyway, I think where I was going with that is is that we don't leave it as just that a thought is causal, right? So, so the the risk of of cognitive therapy analyses from a behavioral position is that you make the thought causal, but of course the thought comes from somewhere, and not everybody does the thing they do to that mm -hmm. thought you just had. So there's this idiosyncratic or uh, ideographic part that we would mm -hmm. miss, as well as the analytic part. But I think that if we approached act from like a strict mechanistic approach, which which Steve Hayes, Kelly Wilson, Kirk Strassel, Robin Walser, Sonia Batten, uh, Emily Sandoz, no one would say that, right? No one would say, approach it as if it were a tool. Mm -hmm. But the risk is that the client adopts it as a tool, or sometimes the therapist adopts it as just a tool where they say, well, I had this thought, so I just needed to give this, this uh, mindfulness exercise to it, and then that would that would work. And if it does work, great. But notice that we're probably ignoring other things going on. Right. And that one single thought that you had of, I have to please my brother, that you were making room for may not have been an incorrect thought to have, but just a problematic way of phrasing it. Hmm. That what you may also have in there that you're making room for, that you don't have to follow that rule, which if that works, that's great. 
but you may want to make room for, I feel disconnected from my brother. Mm. My brother matters, and I don't know if I'm clean that he knows that. Mm. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so suddenly, like, it goes, yeah. and the context becomes not just what am I feeling, what's driving the behavior, but how does that act, that thought, yeah. sit in a context that participates with profound social variables of interest? Yeah. Yeah. Did it, I just watched your face change. Did it, did it <laughs> ring a bell, or was it just like, God, he's talked too much, or what, what, what just happened? <laughs> The, the clean, the, the yeah. clean, you know, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a lot for of all of us. It's, that's mm-hmm. a lot of work to do, right? My mm-hmm. dad passed away a couple of years ago, huge, rich, complex relationship growing up, fairly classic, conflictual, mm-hmm. real huge problems. And then over the last 20 years became much closer in part because of Jen Gregg, this act therapist, professor, my partner mm-hmm. uh, would ask questions when I'd be so frustrated with him, even though we had become closer, are you clean with him? Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, I don't know, you know, which meant no. And so really working on having some version where it's like as clean as I can be. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. good. Yeah. And so when he passed, it was really sad, but also I thought he's okay. We're okay. Mm-hmm. There's some metaphysics that sit with that that is not part of this podcast of like, I think I think there's more to heaven and earth, right, than in, mm-hmm. in, our, in my behavioral philosophy. But I do think like it wasn't like, oh, shit, I wish I had told my dad, dot, dot, yeah. dot. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I told him everything. And so, so that idea of broadening the context of like, why am I doing this golf ball thing to say like, am I clean? To notice if that resonates, not that it makes you do something, but it helps you appreciate the behavior a little bit differently. Yeah. And then it may prompt, would you want to, if there was a safe way, not necessarily comfortable, but a safe way to share that with your brother yeah. that wouldn't be overly disruptive, is that worthwhile? And what would that do then to other behaviors of interest? Yeah, it strikes at the, the heart of, of one of my values of just not leaving things on the table. Yeah, right, which is hard, right? Because that which we can pull from the table that we don't leave undone we do quickly because they're workable we work on some and then there's those that are just like oh (laughs) right because of course it matters so there's there's a positive reinforcer there to do what matters to to follow these values these stated verbal kind of um, contingencies of reinforcement but also so many other competing contingencies it would be aversive what if they say dude i've always hated that you're like this is not going the way I thought it would go. And maybe it's worse or it's just uncomfortable. Who wants to sit with discomfort, especially we're therapists, our job is to be all chill. Yeah. Right. right. There's so much there. So much there. In, in not just in in there, but just in what you talked about. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, excited to be able to to step back and listen to this again and unpack it. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Well, what I love about, about your very personal example, quite honestly, is it's just very, um, it's very inviting to, uh, have someone share what's actually going on because we could do a cool like you know here's a classic ocd case that has a little interpersonal stuff or mm-hmm. here's a you know a trauma case which always has interpersonal stuff even though the mm-hmm. therapies don't tend to parse it that way always um so that's just super engaging but what i also really liked about it is the chance to talk about functional assessment as this this tool that isn't just for therapy it's like it's everything right mm-hmm. it's 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 frankly, and this is a goofy example, so maybe this isn't one I should share, but it's like Skinner trying to figure out how to use pigeons to detect, I think it was like dysfunctional bombs or something like that. You know, like it's him saying like, how do I protect the world? How do I protect mm-hmm. people's lives? And us talking about like, how do I show up in this existence and what's keeping me yeah. from showing up? And, and from a therapy perspective then, us having more precise tools to, to maybe then suggest strategies and see if that changed things. And if not, let's circle back. Yeah. Right. That the big challenge, this is kind of the, one of the last things I'd want to say if we're mm-hmm. sort of winding out is mm-hmm. the challenge of owning functional assessment as a clinical strategy is it upfront says, if you do a functional analysis or a functional assessment, and then you go to help the client change and the client doesn't change, it's on you as the therapist, not the client. 
including the concept of resistance. So you remember like, mm -hmm. like psychoanalytically or dynamically, resistance is the client not moving because they won't or can't. Mm -hmm. But the analysis was correct. And this flips that. And in fact, if I go to do something, and let's say you were a client, I asked you that, like, are you clean? And, and you're like, you shut down. Well, it's not that anything is necessarily wrong, but I didn't really include how powerful of a contingency that would be to yeah. actually then forestall this process. And so I need to include that now in the analysis of, hey, we just stepped on something pretty big there. Would it be useful to take a step back or even just to talk about what's showing up before we go to that content that's pretty pretty, mm -hmm. pretty thick there? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm wondering for students and supervisees and consultees yeah. that you work with, where do you start them out in terms of uh, reading around functional assessment and analysis? It's a great question. The challenge I've had with teaching functional assessment is to, to figure out to what extent they're up to speed with a, just a basic learning background. Mm -hmm. And so if there are, if they're like, well, I, this concept of function doesn't make sense, and I go to teach it, mm -hmm. and they're still not getting it, quite honestly, I'll try to look at primers by like, even though they're dry, but like little sections of books by like, you know, Catania wrote a great learning book, um, I might quickly go out to the web and see like, what's a down and dirty uh, uh, understanding of this, but mm -hmm. very quickly try to pair it with something that is really clinical, okay. right? So maybe there's something, um, and I'm not going to probably be as up to date on, on what's most recent in clinical writing, but maybe there's something by, um, you know, JT Blackledge used to write and Liz Gifford used to write pieces that were so accessible, translating act into basic language where you could say, like, let's read through that and then talk about what they were trying to pull out as an important variable to, mm -hmm. to keep it as applied as possible. Because the challenge is I don't think there are a lot for me, but, but hopefully, you know, maybe someone listening to this or or you'll get input of like, no, here's the primer. You just didn't know it. You know, mm -hmm. here's the clinical yeah. primer yeah. That, that we have like. Like we started off with at the beginning of the, the talk, like you have all this kind of engineering talk about, you know, behavior analysis and like, how do we put that over here? And there isn't, there aren't a lot of great bridges there, right? We've tried to do that some in our writing about functional analytic psychotherapy, you know, here's what we think is going on. And those vary from incredibly dry, but pretty cool to a bit fast and loose and slightly less technical. Um, does, does that make sense? So, so it's yeah. got like yeah. the relationship matters and here's why it matters, but, yeah. but, but deliberately trying to step away from. So I think in a lot of ways, the long winded answer of where do I send them is, is to articles that are still waiting to be written really? to, to pieces. Why is that? I mean, I, this, that's the question I, I guess I haven't asked yet. It's like, you know, I, this would be totally speculative and, and probably not even fair necessarily, but uh -huh. I wonder if it's because the journals grew up in a way that there was the really good core BA stuff. You know, Steve used to publish, Steve Hayes used to publish in both of these journals and then the real clinical stuff mm -hmm. and, and could, could talk in both ways so easily that, that how I started writing is, oh, we're going to send this to the behavior analyst because it's, it's really good principles. We're going to send this one to the Journal of Contemporary Psychotherapy because it's it's just it's accessible, and and that the journals didn't necessarily early on. I think JCBS is probably trying to do this, and I just don't know the articles. And there may already be some out there that that try to then have the middle ground a little okay. bit better covered. You know, the challenge is also I don't think functional assessment is terribly seductive or interesting. It's core. Um, and so some of us are talking about like, let's come back to that. Let's kind of make that the foundation rather than the technologies sitting as there's ACT therapy and FAP therapy and, and there's DBT, but actually underneath all of those is this common core and those just get to be the skills we use. Okay. I don't think it's how therapies grow up, but I, yeah. that's kind of the push some of us have. All right. And on that note, I'm just kind of wondering if if uh, someone picked up a, 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 a Glenn Callahan reader, what uh, what are the first couple pieces they're going to find in, in there? What do you suggest as far as for articles? Yeah, articles yeah. Or, or books. Um, you you know, um, 
there's an article that's either coming out or just came out on interpersonal behavior therapy, which Mm -hmm. is an argument for um, coming back to these principles that FAP started with, functional analytics in 1991 started with. And so we, what I hope is with deep respect for the impact it had on our lives, Bill Follett and I wrote um, this piece saying, uh, here's why the principles matter and we need to keep coming back to these. So a lot of what I've actually just said is in that. And I think it's fairly accessibly written. Yeah, um, I, I hope so. it That's, you, yeah. you shared that with me, I believe. Yeah. And and then the other one, you know, this, again, these are the drums, but ideographic assessment, that's functional uh, assessment driven. You know, um, the other drum is uh, the article I wrote with Sabrina Darrow on um, anticipating the fourth wave of, the contemporary behavior therapies, which is stop a priori deciding what therapy the client needs before you've talked to the client because mm-hmm. you're a fat therapist or a DBT therapist or an act therapist. Not that those don't have kick-ass skills because they do. And start with the client, then look at the bucket of all the cool stuff we can do. And if, you know, I'm not a pure DBT therapist. I, I did stage two DBT. I've done some DBT, but if that's what they needed, I would refer them. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I may be able to do some of it. But the reality is I need to fit their problems from that functional assessment about them in their mm-hmm. context to these skills that each of those therapies just do a delightfully good job with. Yeah. But they're different and re- skills. And refer is what you're saying. And, and refer to for those. Like if yeah. someone was like, oh, my God, you are the most act perfect client I've ever seen. I could try it, but I'm not a – they're much better act therapists. And so possibly refer – but if they've got an interpersonal piece, I'm in it, All right? right? Okay. Then I got the balance and I, yeah. I can make the argument. Yeah. So those well, are a couple of pieces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on that um, on that note, this is Glenn's first appearance and there'll be more. I'm yeah. excited to have you back to talk about IBT and, and Thank that, you so much. what you're, you're doing there. Yeah. And, uh, and continue to unpack this really interesting, sometimes boring, sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> challenging material and, and not so sedu- okay how about now i like your non-seductive because i like you know adds a little it's, spice to that but it, but it can be boring right because yeah. because we get geeked out in it yeah. and so unless you were like super into the behavior analysis stuff you're like yeah 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 uh, it's like <laughs> there, it's a lot of a lot of lingo right mm-hmm. it's yeah. it, so i think yeah so we can go with non-seductive uh because it doesn't have the you know what would it like be like for you to live with awareness yeah. courage and love and like well, those all sound great, but what do they actually mean, mm-hmm. right? So it, once you get to that, it becomes non-magical. It becomes yeah. less provocative. Yeah, exactly. I guess the place my mind just went to is like, you know, I've got a, I got some toddler children, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't bust out like Toni Morrison, you know, for them to read, and uh, right. they, they like books with lots of pictures and colors, right. and, and that's kind right. of how we're learning here too. How I mean, that's how I came to to act, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and FAP and whatnot, and so this is a, a journey kind of. Um, reverse engineering. Yeah, I, I love this idea. I think it's super cool. Thank you. Yeah. So Glenn is available for consultation. And one of the things that I've been talking about here is for anybody who is listening and is interested in getting some consultation, consultation, because maybe you don't live in an area where, you know, there's a bunch of third waivers growing on trees. And uh, so, so, um, oh, um, f- folks to like get together, maybe two, three, four people and, and, you know, getting one of someone like Glenn to, to offer kind of group supervision, uh, sure. consultation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, I mean, uh, I think that that's a real viable way that, you know, we probably most of us clinicians can afford to, to really pick this stuff right. up. And because yeah. uh, a one-on-one, I mean, realistically for a lot of us is just, you know, it's difficult, you know? Yeah. And so there's that. I'm going to, I'm going to put your contact information and I will put the link to those articles that you That'd be great. mentioned. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I think, oh, I want to mention too, so I've got another project going on. It's, a, it's another podcast called Honorable Evolution. Hmm. And it's, it's about celebrating folks who have really prioritized health. And so I'm talking to people, musicians, artists, poets, badass yoga nuns, black belts. Maybe I'll get a ninja. Uh, folks who have her survived things like cancer, who have you know, lived, with, lived through a lot, and, uh, and just really champions of health. That's so awesome. That, yeah. I think that's it. That's all I got. Great. This has been really cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks so much. But I'm getting stronger. 
They take a piece of me But I'm getting stronger They take a piece of me But I'm getting stronger They take a piece of me But I'm getting 